All right, guys. Uh, welcome to our first OBL session. Uh, my name is Todd Berland out of New York. Um, Office-based lab, terrible name for really what it is. And um, I, I guess I should first say just quick raise of hands. Um, who here has an OBL? All right, so I'm seeing a very small percentage of patient people here uh, have an OBL. Um, this is good. I want this to be banter back and forth. Uh, I feel like this should be open-ended as questions come up. Just approach the mic. Um, we've got a panel here of uh, physicians who are experienced in OBLs and ASCs. We'll be taking all questions. I have some kind of leader questions that we thought might be important, but this might not cover everything. So I encourage you as questions come up, just come up to the microphone and, and blurt it out. Very informal and I want it to be very informative. So let's just keep an open discussion, uh, respectful discussion, and we'll try to hit all the points, positives, negatives, everything we can about this. Uh, Office-based lab, this basically means doing procedures in your office. So only few people raise their hands. For others out there who don't have an OBL, the reason that this is important and the reason that we love this in the vascular world, when we do a procedure in the hospital, or an ASC, or an Article 28, a hospital-owned uh, surgery center, a cath lab. There's a professional fee for doing something, and there's a facility fee. If you put an SFA stent in, just going to throw out some numbers, your professional fee for doing that in the hospital might be 1000 bucks, but the hospital is going to get twenty or $25,000 in that facility fee, or the ASC will get that 25000 facility fee. Unless you're an owner in that ASC, you don't share in any of that revenue. So as a physician who's working for a hospital, you're just getting and capturing that professional fee, which is going to be the same in the OR, same in the ASC. In the OBL, it's a single global payment. And you guys check me on this. If you guys are saying, if I'm saying anything that you guys think is wrong, please feel free to just interject. But when you're doing something in an office, there's one single global payment that's reduced significantly and goes right to the physician. So an SFA stent might be $12,000 for a Medicare patient. So that $1,000 that you were getting in your ASC or in your OR, you're now getting $12,000 for that. So 12x what you would be getting. Um, and the, so the payers love it because they are paying a lot less money for that SFA stent to go in. Physicians love it because you're getting reimbursed a lot more. The downside is you're paying for that wire, the catheter, the stent the disposable drapes, the lidocaine that you're injecting. Um, so there's different expenses that go into it. We're not talking $12,000 of net profit. We're talking $12,000 as the global payment for that case. And then you're responsible for making um, all the purchasing for all the devices or disposables that you might use. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, I have nothing relevant to disclose here. Um, CSI is sponsoring this session. They've donated money to VESS. I have not accepted a dime from CSI uh, to give this talk, nor anybody on this. I'm not getting paid for this talk, and I've asked all these panelists to be here. To my knowledge, they're not getting paid by anybody either. And I just want to start our, uh, uh, our introductions here. Um, we've got uh, Dr. John Rollo. If you want to raise your hand so they could see who you are here. Trained at UCLA, four years at UW, now back at UCLA, I understand and you spend a significant amount of time in your OBL. Yes. Anything else you want to add to that? No, excited to be here, and uh, I think this is a really important session, and uh, it's going to be a great discussion. Thanks. Uh, next, we have Dr. Jeff Pierce, University uh, Vascular out of Athens, Georgia. He's had an OBL since 2011. Very busy clinical practice, private yep. practice. Yep. Uh, trained at Wake uh, with Matt Corrier, and uh, we opened our OBL 11 years ago, and it's... Uh, Get a little closer to that mic. <clears throat> yeah. Opened our OBL 11 years ago, uh, and it is the, the probably sole reason we are still independent and not employ physicians. Great. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Cherie Wright on the bottom there, bottom uh, of the slide, associate professor at MUSC um, for the last two years, but was previously in private practice where they co-owned an OBL with radiology, and she would, had an active role in the business, man, business management aspect of that. Anything else, Cherie? Just want to confirm I am also not being paid by anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not being paid either. <laughs> no, no one's being paid. <laughs> All right, uh, and then uh, Dr. Matt Smith, University of Washington, medical director of their Vascular Procedure Center. Now, this is a hospital-based um, ASC, so this, you know, his experience is not going to be in an OBL. We're not talking that same single global payment. We're talking he's still getting a professional fee and uh, not profit sharing in the facility fee that that ASC is capturing, but you'll still hear about some of the advantages of that. If some of your um, situations allow for an ASC, you'll hear about the advantages of that. 
I'll just quickly say uh, that Hurricane Sandy did us a favor. You know, there's a saying out of every tragedy comes an opportunity, and in 2012, Hurricane Sandy hit the Northeast. My hospital, NYU, uh, on First Avenue was flooded. We had, you know, overnight, no hospital to do procedures, so we partnered with a uh, access center, a guy who was just doing fistulograms, and literally just start, started doing our angiograms there. Um, it, uh, hospital came back online six weeks later, and while we thought we might have to bring all those cases back, we were able to make a case to the hospital administration saying, listen, endovascular cases are low profit margin cases for you. You're better off having any kind of other case happen in that room. And with the hospital busting at the seams, this was a very easy sell to show them that their margins were lower and they're better off with us out there. So now, uh, tw 10 years later, 4,000 procedures we've done, um, we're, we're still functioning strong uh, at, at our OBL. Now, I've, I'm part of a 10-person group, and we all are, are salaried at NYU, but I will say that three days a week is when this OBL is functioning. I'm there, I'm the Monday-Friday guy, we've got a Wednesday person, and three, those three physi single physician days are 40% of that 10-man group uh, income. So you could see how profitable these things can become. And again, we're university-based, um, and, uh, and, and we're gonna dive into that in just a minute. We're gonna have lots of questions here. As questions come up, please feel free to ask them. Um, we're gonna start just, uh, just with the panel here. I'll, I'll start with, with Jeff. Jeff, just arbitrarily, what are the best candidates for the OBL? Some people say too old, too sick. Who, who's a candidate, who's not a candidate for an OBL procedure? That's a great question. So we had consider, con, significant consideration uh, for this question when we first opened our OBL. And so when we set it up, we set up as close to, to mirror the hospital setting as we could for that for that fear. Um, over time, we have found that the patients you would normally probably not be able to do an ASC because they're ASA 4s and what have you, we can do readily in our office setting safely. Uh, we, As I've mentioned uh, to some of the panels up here, we use a CRNA for all of our anesthesia, and our CRNA will supervise and, and monitor that patient, allowing you to, as, as a surgeon to focus on the task at hand. Um, and that provides a level of comfort for us to do some of these sicker patients with, you know, uh, compensated heart failure, compensated uh, pulmonary compromise. Um, we do a lot of dialysis work in our office. Um, and the, most of those patients are gonna be ASA-4s. Um, and so I don't think there's a particular patient who is not a candidate except for those who have uncompensated heart failure, uncompensated medical conditions, that just are not safe to have a procedure done in right. general. Yep. Shree, any thoughts on that? I'll ask everybody this question, and then we'll kind of bounce back and forth. Just a few, few sentences. Who's the, who's the best yeah. patient? Who's not the ideal patient? So similar concepts or similar thoughts on the patients that we selected to do in our office space lab. So it's a lot of, you know, finding, you know, the eyeball test. There are patients that we look at, and you see them, and you're like, there's absolutely no way they're going to lay flat on this table with a little bit of sedation. Mm -hmm. It's not safe. Are there patients that you know or you anticipate, like, if something goes horribly awry, I need to be able to have a, lar a higher level of support there in forms of anesthesia, other physicians, but for our lab, it was a lot of dialysis patients, vein patients, patients that um, could tolerate, you know, a quick angio diagnostic, looking at an SFA, interventions on previous things like a bypass stent or a bypass that needed a quick angioplasty. So it's the patients themselves, my comfort level with them. Um, we actually did our own sedation there, so my lab didn't have a CRNA. Um, so again, that factored into these, the patients that I see that I knew, okay, I can give you a little sedation. They're gonna listen to me, I'm gonna listen to them. My nursing staff could handle what was coming up and it wasn't anything too per, super complex that I was doing there. Got it, Matt and John. Um, yeah, we have a, a relatively similar model of that. There's no patient that's too sick to be in the, the ASC that, that could otherwise get a procedure, though we do have a couple interesting things that are based on how we built our lab. We have a, a weight cut off because the tables you get to get in an in ASC are, are much less robust than those you might get in an OR. So you know, we have a BMI cut off of, of 45 strictly um, patients on, because we do all of our sedation with a very good nurse anesthetist. Uh, we don't allow anybody who's on current high doses of Suboxone or Methadone that our sedation nurse wouldn't be able to, to give medication to to work well. Um, and that's, re oh, and then the last thing is that if we're unable to get an in-person interpreter um, for uh, people who, if there's a language barrier, then we usually defer those cases to where if that patient needed something urgently, they had an anesthesiologist available, but that's secondary to our 
sedation patterns. Yeah, and I would uh, echo all that and just add that uh, in, our, in my experience, many patients that um, you would think are too sick for an OBL, uh, they actually end up getting uh, much, uh, have much more problems in the cath lab because they end up getting over sedated by anesthesia, they either get intubated for no reason, um, or they can't, they can't do a, a propofol sedation very well and they end up being over sedated, having all kinds of arrhythmia problems. Uh, we've had multiple dialysis patients die in the cath lab, from, not from any procedure, but from the sedation. And that never happens in the OBL. Right. I want to echo all of that. Um, there's no, I think, chronological age that is a contraindication. We've done 99-year-olds there. Because the sedation's kept so light, we contract with an anesthesia group that's used to outpatient procedures. They're not the OR anesthesiologists that we're all used to dealing with that are just hitting these patients with a sledgehammer. They keep yeah. it really light. The patients have to just be MPO for four hours. Uh, we are using low, um, I'm personally getting the access, we're holding pressure, we are um, mobilizing these patients after two hours, they're not having to lay flat for some uh, hospital-based OR six-hour lay flat protocol, so we're moving these patients quicker. I anecdotally think that it, it may be even safer because we're keeping patients so much lighter. I will also say that in the state of New York, it is a reportable event if you have to transfer a patient to an ER from an OBL or if there is a hospital admission within 72 hours. That's all a state reportable event. And if you're not flying under 3%, that you're going to have to answer to that. So every time there's an issue, you have to report within 24 hours what it was and what's happening with that patient in order for your lab to continue accreditation. Igor. Yeah, just a quick comment. I'm in Westchester, New York. Because of our face structure, we don't have a um, OPL in our institution, but we do use a cath lab like an OBL. We don't have anesthesia. The, anest uh, the uh, sedation is administered by surgeons uh, with uh, privileges for moderate uh, analgesia, and we don't rely on uh, the, in the cath lab, on anesthesiologists for sedation. But having said that, I second your experience with peripheral blocks and with angios done in the operating room where patients are over sedated, anesthesiologists are too basically aggressive with sedating patients who are under, otherwise very comfortable that leads for peri to perioperative complications. So um, just a comment that you don't really have to have anesthesia even if you work in a hospital and if you rely on a cath lab. Right. Now, what I've just learned, just minutes, thank you for that, Igor, on, on that note, it sounds like if you're at an ASC and you're a surgeon doing this procedure, you can actually bill for the sedation. It's a separate RVU. Again, I'm not an RVU system. You could give me an RVU number. I have no idea what that means. We're collections-based, but yeah. apparently there is it's a, a very a, small number. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a small it's number. It's about $19 you, per case. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but I will say that our first 500 cases, we did giving the sedation ourselves, and then we learned very quickly that having an anesthesiologist there is free help. Basically, the anesthesia, unlike a, a, a wire or a stent or a balloon or the nurses that are costing 50 to to $100 an hour or the actual space itself, an anesthesiologist is doing their own billing. So it costs you $0 to have an anesthesiologist there. So the last 3,500 procedures, we have an anesthesiologist there. It's very comforting to know you have another MD there on site. So when the patient in PACU, it's a little hypotensive or their oxygen sats are 88%, you're not being distracted from your procedure. You've got an anesthesiologist there. So we learned quickly, you know, after several hundred procedures, that it was easier to have an anesthesiologist there. And they're, they're usually happy to do it, and these are not the same anesthesiologists that you're used to using in your main OR. Um, I will say, just how much do you think it costs to open an OBL? Panelists, give me a number. How much? Uh, it depends. Okay, uh. it depends. <laughs> uh, One million, two million? Can I just tell you I right now? Zero dollars, okay? We have never paid a single dollar. If you're thinking it's a financial constraint, you can literally partner with somebody who already has an OBL and who's either JCO or Quad A certified, and we could talk about that. And you rent space for the day. If you're not sure that your group has the volume, you rent space for a day, whether a Friday, a Saturday, pick that day. Once you change your site of service, your provider, your MPI number shows that you have another office at this location, you do all the billing and are collecting from that. You are an owner of that space for those eight hours and you could literally just pay rent to a space and literally not come forward with a single dollar. You don't need that initial outfit that some might think you need for an OBL. So how much is the rent for 
So listen, we're in New York and rent's expensive. We pay, <laughs> we pay $5,000 a day to be at the OBL, but we thought of this as a partnership. We're currently uh, in a suite that's owned by radiology. They've got a fixed, uh, fixed equipment on one side. We have a CRM on the other. They're doing procedures on one side. We're doing them on the other, and we pay them $5,000 a day to do as many cases as we can, but we have to have the last patient rolling out at 5 p.m., you, so which means we, if we're starting a, 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 we can't start an arterial case at 3 p.m. because those patients need to lay flat for two hours, and if there's an issue with access that requires them to lay longer, you're going to be paying overtime to nurses, and that's actually not ideal for us. So we'll do access cases, venous cases, you know, around that 2:30, 3 p.m. mark, and then everybody recovers and everybody's out by 5 p.m. We pay 5,000 a day, but I think you could do that probably a lot cheaper in other places in the country. Give you just one second, oh, sorry, Mike, right there. I was going to comment. Yeah. We, um, in the practice I had, we co-owned the OBL with a intervention with a radiology group, particularly the IR portion of that radiology group. But um, you know, we were in there as the surgeons uh, three days a week. The radiologist was on site all, like at five days a week, just kind of as like an MD physician there. And then we did rent out space to a cardiology group on two days a week. And you have, um, it's a benefit to that where you have some oversight, some say into what procedures they are doing there um, mm -hmm. to make sure, you know, and it's, it's, if you're going to rent out space, understanding, and we'll get into it later, like the cost of things, what they have, what's available, because one of the cardiology group was using like a whole bunch of stuff and they, their overhead, what they were using could not, in fact, like it couldn't cover their, like they were outspending what they were paying. So they ended up pulling out and we had to, Right. There were other people that came in. Yeah, we, we pay that money per day, and then we also pay for all the equipment and supplies that we use, and we manage all the inventory. Jeannie. Yeah. I thought your comment about the um, renting of space, at least early on, if a person was going into this model, was really valuable. But did anybody on the panel actually have to go through the certificate of need process to build the OBL? No. And I was curious if anybody could comment on no. that. You He's don't require the state of Georgia. You don't, certificate of need is needed for hospitals, for ASCs, but an OBL is yeah. just like an office. If you're a doctor setting up shop in middle of nowhere, wherever, you don't need a certificate of need to do that. This is just an office, so you don't, that's the advantage of an OBL. You don't need a, a CON. Hey, Todd, I can, I can, the specific question you asked about what it costs to build an OBL, I can speak to you a little more uh, intimately since I was the one who organized ours. In a time, we were a four-man group when we opened our OBL, um, and you can open an OBL up in today's environment for less than a million dollars. I mean, you can buy the, the uh, angio injector, if you can buy one on eBay, which we did, believe it or not, we bought an angio injector off of eBay, and um, had BedRag come in and certify it. Uh, that was a couple thousand dollars. The table cost about $50,000. Your CRM will cost you about $200,000, and then you have construction. Uh, most of the equipment on, on the, the disposables and stuff, you partner with your industry, there'll be consignment. You don't have to put a lot of money out for that uh, equipment. So you can easily open an OBL for less than a million dollars. That's true. A number of the imaging uh, companies also have packages that they can set up mm -hmm. for you for a low cost that is deferred payment until, you know, for a year. It's, there's, there's ways to do it. Um, yeah, the CRM will come on a 10-year lease with mm -hmm. a dollar buyout at the end. Right. Yeah. And it all depends on um, how fancy you're going to be. Like I said, so I think our group, with, they opened it prior to me starting, but I had the joy, I guess we can say, of sitting in on a lot of the business meetings when they discussed like cost and payment and et cetera. And I think it was slightly over a million, but that's because they went all out with the, the patient rooms, exam rooms, and this stuff, and like the C-arm, the fixed unit, the screens. And so oh, fixed unit. Uh, it, it, was, it was a lot. Um, <laughs> they were extra, but it was nice. But then across town, there was another group that had an OBL and theirs was like, look, we got a C-arm, we got a table, we got a basic screen, we have these rooms, it's not all flashy and there's less cost, but same efficiency and same amount of profit for each group. Yep. Just to add to that, ours is pretty, um, pretty sophisticated. We actually were able to open three in two years, um, but we also got packaging deals from different industry sponsors for atherectomy mm -hmm. devices, IBIS, all those things. Like you, if you, they'll group things together where you can get, you know, every atherectomy device you open come with this automatic with a specific crossing catheter, a specific wire, and then you get a, a lot of cost benefits from that. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is you're paying a lot less than the hospital is, and that's really the problem where the system is. The hospital are worse negotiators than we are. As users who care about the price, we're able to get balloons, wire sense, catheters, atherectomy devices much, much cheaper than the hospital is able to get it. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's probably an issue for the hospitals, but we are able to get these things cheaper because we are bargaining directly with industry itself. Let's go ahead and take your question. Uh, Chuck Fox from Baltimore. I'm at the University of Maryland. We're opening our third OBL 
Uh, we're an all academic practice, uh, but in order to be competitive, we've had to get out into the communities. And to do that, um, we put $1.5 million into our Baltimore OBL and then went down into Charles County, Southern Maryland and spent $1 million and then we just opened one in Largo for another million. Um, we decided that we would just lease our building and run an OBL five days a week and then we take our partners, 18 of us, and just sort of divide the days up mm -hmm. in a very fair and equitable way. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you guys can comment on whether you do trans radio access because that might eliminate some of the uh, two hour blocks of time that you were talking about. Yeah, so I'll answer that question first. I will if I'm dealing with upper extremity. I love radial access if you're dealing with subclavian, um, but I find it very difficult. Even with Terumo's, you know, R2P product, you know, long lengths, I can do the procedures much faster with anti-grade SFA access. So I've done that about a thousand times. Four French sheath, you could get most of these devices and up to a six millimeter balloon through a four French sheath anti-grade access. It also, a lot of our patients are critical limb ischemia. We're not treating many claudicans at all. So these are patients all tibial disease with wounds. We can keep it four French, SFA, very fast procedure. No closure device, of course, but holding pressure for 12 minutes, two hours flat and out the door. I just find that from the radial, it's too hard to get to the tibials. Yeah, okay. but it is Thanks safe. I agree. Comment. Yeah, so it's patient selection and really uh, mm -hmm. the time that you spent is one way or the other. Yeah, yeah this is a, this is such an interesting question because every every everybody on this panel will have a different answer to this question. I do everything retrograde, contralateral, common femoral access up and over, and I use closure device on every case. So I proglide every time. You know, six six French most most interventions, and I agree for the same reason. I don't do a lot of radial because I can't reach the areas I need to get to and I don't have any bailouts if I cause a problem. It's just the devices are really limited for the radial to, you know, radial to pedal uh, uh, distances. They're just not, it's not very effective for me. I, Much I, like John, I do quite a bit, over the top six French, except for diagnostics, which will try to keep the four French and avoid the closure device. Yeah. I've, I've used it quite a bit. I used the four or five long slender from Terumo that you were just talking about. Um, but usually, you know, we have our own our own lab on site as well. So if I have a good idea that they have SFA disease primarily, then I'll go that direction. Um, and that's just because, yeah, I've actually had those patients where their their uh, closure device failed and bleeding, and I'm transporting them to the hospital. So um, for that for that reason, I'm I'm less likely to stick integrate, and I'll, I'll go from the arm or the even. Right. And we go back to the original question: Which patients are best candidates? And it's not a chronological age. To me, it's mm -hmm. about an arterial age. I like to get CTAs on everybody so I can see where my access is going to be. It's all about access, access, access. I want to see a window where I can get a four French sheath in and be able to safely hold pressure without a hematoma, without a complication uh, to keep these quick. Again, because you have to be efficient, we're an hour, to, wheels in, wheels in is one hour. So we've got one C arm, patient's coming in at 8 a.m., next patient's being started at 9 a.m. So we're doing, starting the case at 8, we're doing the intervention, it's an SFA access, tibial artery, SFA pop, whatever it may be. You are transferring the patient out. As they're transferring, I'm pulling the sheath, holding pressure, the room's being cleaned, and the next patient's being brought in on the hour, every hour, and that's how you're able to be very efficient. Question over there. Hi, Hi. Um, it's kind of interesting because I'm in competition with the University of Maryland. Um, we work in a great Baltimore area, and we have four, OB, four OBLs we've started 11 years ago also. So one thing I noticed you were talking about lending the space for another group. You have to be cautious with that also because that other group will become your comp competitor. They'll come in, learn what they need to know, and they'll open down the street, which happened to us. Um, so you have to be careful of how good you are as far as a friend because business is business. Um, there was another point I had. Um, brachial access. We do use, utilize a lot of brachial access for iliac occlusions if you can't do retrograde access. Um, radial access, we don't, we don't use at all, but brachial access is pretty, pretty common. So yeah, I, I respect the brachial artery. I, yeah. I find it, um, you don't want an issue with the brachial artery, so yeah. I, I, I'm not a big brachial artery access person. I'd go radial before I'd go brachial. Mm -hmm. yeah. But to your point, you've got to really be careful who you're partnering with. There's Stark laws. One of the reasons we pay rent, and it's illegal mm -hmm. to fee split. What you can't do is partner with somebody and say, hey, we'll give you a percentage of whatever this reimburses. That is totally illegal. You can give a flat fee per mm -hmm. case, or you could rent space per case, um, but it's illegal to fee split. It's also illegal if that other group 
who you're partnering with or renting space, sends the open aneurysm to your group because that is also seen as uh, anti-competition there because of a quid pro quo, if you will. Um, so you have to be careful with how those referrals will go. We're with radiologists who aren't doing peripheral procedures. They're doing chemoembolizations and, and regular IR kind of things. They're not dabbling in the vascular world, so we don't have to deal with that, but that's a great point. And, and we don't see each other as competition. We see the interventional cardiologists as compression, uh, as competition. Those guys are the ones that are opening OBLs, potentially doing unindicated procedures for a quote unquote leg pain without an AVI, without documented pulses. These guys are the ones that I think are given OBLs a, a bad name. And one more thing, when you build OBL, don't go cheap. Do the right stuff, get the right equipment. Don't go for the cheapest company because you're gonna use it for 10 years. Uh, right. We have all floor mounted Toshiba units. You know, they cost a lot of money rather than a just having a C-arm, but tell you what, the cases go much faster, the patients have better results, so don't, don't look at early money. Sorry, another uh, question. Uh, yeah, Matt Cronick from Springfield, Mass. Um, this may be jumping the gun a bit, but you know, as an employed physician with a sort of half salary, half RVU-based competition, I'm curious how other employed physicians are sort of navigating the RVU space with their health system in terms of making it worth both your whiles. Um, you know, how, how's that working out for the academic and employed physician? Yeah, th this is actually a really uh, important topic. So I can speak from both perspectives. Um, I trained at UCLA, which is not RVU based, it's collections based. Uh, and that system um, favors uh, the collections um, that, that you keep a percentage of essentially based on your expenses to the university. And there's a whole P&L profit and loss statement that goes through all of that. Um, so that's a very different system. It's much more like a private practice where you have a, a profit and loss statement and you keep whatever's left over. Um, after training, uh, for my first job, I went to University of Washington, which is RVU based. And uh, at, at the University of Washington, I lobbied and argued for uh, opening our own office-based ASC, which Matt now runs. Uh, and that, um, you know, it started off as an OBL, but for, for various technical reasons, we needed to make an ASC because it was hospital owned. Anyway, regardless, it functions the exact same way as an OBL. Um, benefits, you get a lot increased patient throughput, scheduling's a lot easier, I have complete control over my uh, anesthesia that happens in that, in that room. Um, my days are much smoother, I can do many more cases and be done uh, a lot sooner in the day. Downside is that um, I was not able to, uh, you know, create any profit sharing with the university for that because it was my first job and I was, you know, one year out of training and, and I could barely get them to build the thing in the first place. So, so are you getting the same number of RVUs to do a case there as you would in an ASC or a main OR? That's correct, <coughs> uh, which is a really good deal for the hospital. Right, but you're also able to do, be more efficient with procedures and get more procedures done in the day. Side benefit is that I got whatever I wanted at that hospital. If I needed a nurse practitioner, oh boy, nurse practitioner was, was there the next day. Yes. It has been done. It has been done. We're collections based, so I haven't had to deal with the RVUs. Anybody else have that? I mean, it's not, it's not just about that, though. I mean, the other thing is, I can speak to what John started, you know, it's the difference between going home at 4 p.m. versus waiting for two-hour turnover times and exactly. everything else, and going home at 7 p.m. So, you know, we we have a, a saying five by five. You know, where where you do a minimum of five cases, and we do we, we don't have something as efficient as rolling patients in every hour, but we do do I do do complex multi-tibial angios with pedal sticks and ivis and you know four liters of total contrast, you know, very complex <laughs> procedures in our in our OBL, and, but still go home at five o'clock. Yeah, it's yeah. a huge difference in your life, yeah. and it's yes. definitely worth it. Whether you get a piece of that, which I would, I would argue that you should, uh, you know, forcefully argue for at least an RVU bump, an RVU, you know, doubled RVUs, et cetera, or some kind of profit sharing, I would strongly favor that, but, um, you know, good luck. It's, it's a much more efficient model. It's way more efficient. So we, uh, my group went from a private, completely private practice onto a hospital employed model, um, kind of halfway through my time there in the RVU. So we went from collections base um, before into an RVU model once we became hospital employed. And my other partner that went there quickly realized like my RVU reimbursement 
based on doing things in the OBL was so much better than the hospital. Again, for all the things that have been mentioned. I could do three angios and two veins in the span of like a morning before going to my office at like three o'clock, as opposed to one and a half angios in the hospital system, wait for turnover, the room's busy, somebody else is there. And another thing that added to that efficiency is like that, the people in the OBL are the same people Monday through Friday, right? So you've got, yeah. imagine like your operating room team, which are dedicated OR staff that can get that aorta patient like on the table, off the table, in the pack, you turn the room over, have all your things, that's there every single angio that you do. So it's kind of like, let's go, go, go. It seems to be yeah. you guys in the 100%. same order. 100%, very efficient, very echo that. Gabby. Hi, how are you? Good morning. Uh, Gabby Velasquez from Wake Forest University in North Carolina. So we do not have an, an OBL, and whenever we have those discussions, there obviously it's kind of like a kind of no, we can't do that. Long story short, it all sounds wonderful, but let's be honest, there's got to be these advantages and downsides of it. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, as we know, OBLs have been demonized in a way, and I think we all, everyone here knows that. So I will be interested to know uh, from the panel and their experience that you've had for many years now, what are the things that you got to be careful? What are the things that we have to watch for? What are the things that we really need to um, make sure we don't have so that we aren't, don't run into these problems because there's got to be, you know, a downside to it. 100%. And that was my next slide because I feel like you got to attack the elephant in the room. Like, lack of regulation and oversight. I mean, are there people out there doing a 4.9 centimeter AAA? Are, you, are there people doing a, a carotid stenosis that's less than 80%? Um, are veins being ablated that are small and not refluxing? Yes. I think there's malpractice going on everywhere in all specialties. You see it a lot more just from a frequency bias standpoint when you're a vascular specialist seeing other people. You're like, what the hell? Those guys are criminals. What are they doing over there? This is going to happen. This doesn't mean that you have to stop the whole practice of medicine. There is, I believe, a, a lack of regulation and oversight. I think that would be helpful. We're part of VQI, as many of you guys are, but that doesn't really help. Certainly the state reporting of any complication is helpful, but there really is a missing link for regulation to prevent some of those people who are out there operating an OBL. Like I mentioned before, I don't, I won't, I don't want to be specialty specific because there are vascular surgeons that are abusing this too, doing unindicated atherectomies on tibial vessels for claudicants. And until there's a way to regulate that better, all we can do as physicians is try to do the right thing. And to demonize an OBL system uh, because of those few bad apples is the wrong idea. The patients love it. It's easier. It's better for them. Um, and it's better for the physicians. We don't need to do any favors for our administrators. This just really keeps it in the treating physician's hands and control in the treating physician's hands. Any other comments? Yeah. There's a lot of challenges to running an OBL, um, but I will say it is completely worth it. Uh, I, I, when you ask what are the downsides of, of having and operating an OBL, there are no downsides. It is, it is a 100% upside. It takes work to run it correctly. It takes, you know, some regulation. You have to follow all the regulations. You have to get, all the, um, get uh, maintenance of certification, et cetera, but uh, all of that is completely worth it. I'll, I'll make the, the, the comment that there's procedures being done in the outpatient setting, there are procedures done in the hospital setting that are not indicated all the time, um, and we know that. Um, I, I, but our more people are there to see that. When you're in an OBL, True. just yourself with some text that may not be knowing what you're seeing, in the hospital, you, you know, there's a lot of people looking. Th that's very true. Um, but I approach this as no different than I was, I was doing in the hospital, which is how we did it for the first three years I was in town. Uh, I take care of patients the same way, whether it be in the OBL or in the office, uh, or in the hospital setting. The only difference to me is that I am more cost conscious when I'm in the OBL setting. Instead of opening, and I don't want to disparage any particular, but if you open a prograde sheath to do a cross and SFA lesion that costs $500 versus using a Benson wire which costs $10 and a long and comfy catheter which costs $10 and you achieve the same result, well that, that, that's how I focus on, uh, with use, uh, focus the OBL on as, as far as 100%. We're never trying to be a good steward of resources in our hospital. We're not incentivized to not be wasteful. That's unfortunately a, a problem with the system. But mm -hmm. when you're in the OBL, where every you're getting paid that $12,000 for that SFA atherectomy stent, and every single thing you use comes off that $12,000, you very quickly learn the price of devices, wires, catheters, and do it in the cheapest, safest way you can. The wrong thing would be do, to do is to treat patients differently. Um, if you know the patient needs a DCB, again, an angioplasty has a set code. You're not getting paid more because that balloon has paclitaxel on it. That balloon costs 6x, you know, the cost of a, a plain old balloon. But um, if you're doing things different in the OBL than you would in the hospital, then, then you're not doing the right thing, in my opinion. So as long as you've got 
DCBs on the shelf and you're able to use those, um, then, then I, I don't think you're doing the wrong thing. So yeah, I reiterate what everybody says. It's the oversight, it's like making sure you're doing the right thing for the right patient. You're selecting the right patient for that situation, for that area. Um, I, same thing. Everybody that I did in OBL, I treated like triage in the exact same way that I did in the hospital. I, like use it as an extension of my block time in the hospital. So my days I'm like, okay, put them on for Wednesday, this person's Friday. Um, it's, and I will, I will, co-sign what you said about um, supplies and equipment. I'm always amazed when my trainees like start off a diagnostic injury like the most expensive wire ever and I'm like why we can completely do this with a glide wire like what are we doing like we don't need and they're like why not you know you get so used to I think in the hospital system like or even when I was in training and fellowship of just having those things readily accessible so I'm like what's that super you know diamond coated wire sparkling give it to me I want to use it as opposed to I can get across this with a glide and a burn we don't need to go that route just yet right so you I get a little more I know more now like what things cost I factor that in I do what I need to do to keep patients safe and get the good outcome without having to utilize a whole bunch of stuff yeah. and oh. that I've carried along with me from that practice pattern to where I am currently great M moving on and we'll keep it going lively discussion how do you get and maintain inventory in an OBL uh, I'll start off by saying we don't have anything 018 I, I use 014 for really low profile and then my regular 035 and just from a real estate standpoint just not enough room on the shelves to, to carry 018 so I don't have a, a huge 018 platform I kind of stay small and 035 I don't know about you guys yeah I use I use a little bit of everything um, but I agree with you I most of what I do is over an 014 um, often with a filter basket if we're doing atherectomy so wow um, I haven't used a filter basket in 11 years yeah well <laughs> I love a filter okay. I've never used one what? makes wow. me makes every me case happy. Thank you. Really, I've never used one. It's like team um, filter, team no filter. Yeah. I, I think we, for my group, we have a, we have two techs that worked with us for the last 12 years. Uh, and one is basically that's his job, his role. He, he maintains uh, equipment on shelf. We use something, it's get the order that day, uh, and we just have this constant influx of inventory every day that gets restocked on the shelves. Um, yeah, the inventory maintenance is actually one of the easier parts, I would say, of, of running the OBL because the the, every company is, is very, most of them are very willing to provide uh, consignment stock that they manage for the most part. And um, there's some, some uh, you know, uh, kind of administrative work that has to go into that, but it's, it's quite simple. And I will say, it goes back to what I said earlier about having like the same staff and the same people there throughout Monday through Friday throughout the week. So we had a lead tech and that was, you know, as part of helping with the cases and making sure it we went smoothly. Thursday she went through and said, okay, here's what we've used so far this week. This is what we're running low on. She generated a list. We all looked at it, said, yep, yep, yep. And it just keeps, because that's their, their focus, as opposed to, you know, your, your team lead in the hospital that so many other things are going on. Sometimes that information gets lost in the shuffle, and then you take time, you're like, well, let me go check my carts. Let me make sure these are all here. Like, did we forget to reorder X, Y, and Z? So it just, it, overall, the process was just way more efficient. I would say it's that's awesome. one, of, one of the major benefits overall is that your staff cares about you and your OBL, and that's not the case in the hospital. It's also much easier. So I, it, I did this, it, the inventory at the OBLs back when I worked there, but um, now that I work at the VA system, I'm responsible for the inventory for multiple VA facilities. Um, and negotiating those terms with, you know, with the uh, new process councils and, and negotiating or justifying why something's needed in the in the hybrid room setting and all that. It's actually much more complicated. In the OBL, it's just really back down to an Excel spreadsheet of what makes sense from a dollars and cents perspective. And the the um, the uh, industry people that you're with are incentivized to help you make that work. All right. Let's move on to um, complications. What do you do if things go wrong? I've had two iliac artery ruptures, not while treating the iliacs, but just up and over access, treating the contralateral side, and patients were hypotensive in the recovery room. You know, what do you do in those situations? We are not attached to a hospital. We're four blocks away, which is, you know, 45 minutes uh, in an ambulance. You really just have to call 911 if somebody is having an issue. But in those situations, we do have covered stent grafts. I think the patient would have died if we tried to transfer to the hospital. It just can't happen fast enough. What you do is you just get them right back to the room, to the procedure room, identify the lesion, and we've got stent grafts on the shelf for these kinds of emergencies. What do you guys think about being associated with a medical facility, 
versus emergencies? How do you guys deal with that? I've, I've done the same thing um, twice. As a matter of fact, it was the scariest I've ever been. Um, <laughs> and I just went up and over, and, and you know, I've had to put covered sense into, well into the common um, on occasion because for whatever reason, it just tore in a very unusual way. Um, and then I you know, took him to the hospital after that and then, then repaired, um, pulled the stent out in one case. The other case, it was in the external annex, so it was fine. Um, but you just have to do whatever you have to do to temporize them and make sure that they do not you know, die in your facility and then and get up to the appropriate place. But you have to temporize them. And that's one of the things I was going to say about the downsides is you really have to make sure when you um, are selecting a small subset of inventory, you have to make sure you have a plan B, C, and D for everything that could go wrong in order to do that. And that's going to take up shelf space. Yep, absolutely. Any other thoughts, I, did, comments? I mean, I do the same. So whenever certain cases, like, you know, if I'm doing iliac cases or if I was doing an SFA, I think I look ahead and say, okay, what do we have in the way of our coverage stents today? If I'm doing something down that's near the problem, like, what do we have in case something goes wrong? And, you know, everybody's like, well, you're so negative. And I'm like, no, I'm prepared. Um, so, because I want to know what I have on the shelf currently. My, um, where I was before that, OBL was about seven minutes away from the hospital. And the few, there were like three, I can remember three, like a failed closure, an iliac case, um, and then like uh, an occlusion. Um, and literally this, everybody was so, they were so connected to the hospital system itself, like they knew the lab was there, and everyone that worked there had privileges at that hospital, that it was just a phone call, and I'd call and be like, hey, I gotta bring someone over from the lab. And they're like, okay, cool, just come straight to the recovery room, or to pack holding, and we'll see them there. And I'm like, great. And then they call EMS, they get there, we temporize them, make sure they're safe, and then just kind of roll right in. Yeah, our, our facility at UCLA is actually physically connected to the hospital in a separate building, we're on the same campus. Um, but we still, if there's an issue, we still call 911, and that, it's kind of comical, but um, an ambulance shows up at our door and then drives around the back of the building to the, to the ER to, to take care of it. It's very, it's very rare, but you have to have a, a plan for what, you know, when that's going to happen, when it goes wrong, you have to have a plan for it, and you have to be prepared with the proper equipment, temporize the patient, just like you said. Most common complications we've had are protamine reactions. We don't check ACTs on everybody. We empirically give heparin. We reverse with protamine at the end. Sometimes it, uh, we'll have a protamine reaction where the patient will become hypotensive in the recovery room. If they're an anti-grade, pro-grade case, I know that it's not an iliac artery rupture, so I'm not as concerned. Um, but these are good reasons to have an anesthesiologist there and not be giving the sedation on your own because they are well equipped at managing those patients in that situation. Has anybody incurred a code in their procedure OBO? Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have had a code. Had um, it was a cardiac event, like a, a cardiac ischemic event. Um, I wasn't a, a part of it, but that was the only, you know, in the last 10 years, the only one that I know of. We had a dialysis patient code like, at all. Those are the yeah. sickest patients. The dialysis yeah. patients will have things go wrong, and that's why there's a 3% threshold, at least in New York, to have transfer to uh, an ER from your facility. That's acceptable. But that's that. also why we have a code card, and we have of a course. set up there yeah. to deal um, with that. So and, and when you're talking about getting JCO or Quad A um, accredited for an OBL, there's certain criteria that have to be met. Your entrance has to be a certain way. Your egress and ingress have to be very specific. You have to have a PACU. It's a little bit more regulation for an ASC. And then the ASC, like we mentioned, you need that certificate of need. What very savvy people are doing right now are you're going for that aggressive uh, certificate of need, getting the ASC, and you're an ASC on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and that exact same facility is an OBL on Tuesday or Thursday. And you're, I don't want to use the word gaming the system, but you're doing the procedures that reimburse you more on the days where it's an ASC, if it's an ASC, better reimbursed procedure, and the opposite for OBL. So, well, again, at NYU, we don't do that. We just have the OBL because the ASC means nothing to us. And the, um, uh, it's a little bit more strict, the criteria for the ASC. It also um, is very important to make sure you have people there that can recognize when something's wrong, right? So we talked about the efficiency of the OBL. We talked about how you're able to do cases, but you got to remember when you finish your first case, they're in the recovery room, you're already in the middle or in the midst of your second case. So you have to trust that your recovery nurse, your recovery team is able to recognize like, this ain't right, like let me come in there. They're comfortable enough to pop their head in. Um, having another person on site, like I said, there was an interventionalist that was always in the building. So there was another MD available. Um, we had, I think we're gonna cover it, we had um, PAs also available. So if it was, hey, this, there's a hematoma, we're going to hold pressure more, you can trust that that person's holding pressure in the right space or something. So having someone that can recognize that. Right. 
let's keep it moving. Ac uh, how can you do it in academia? Um, you know, as soon as we opened our OBL, well, I should say maybe two or three years afterwards, we applied to ACGME and had that as another official rotation for our vast year residents and fellows to come through. Now, again, access to me is very sacred. You don't want those access site complications. So unless it's the fifth year resident or that, you know, second year five and two fellow, um, the junior residents are really just kind of watching the procedures or dilating the balloons or maybe crossing a lesion, but they're not getting the access. Those are just our senior residents, and I see one right there in the back corner. Um, the, he I will let do, uh, but, but nobody else. Are you guys able to incorporate um, fellows and trainees into your program? So we have, we have trainees, mostly junior residents, who rotate through us at our site, um, second and third year integrated residents. Um, and we have a, we've had five, kind of tying this into the last question, we've had five total transfers to the hospital in the last four years. Uh, and we are, we are physically associated with the hospital, so it's much easier for us to do that. But four of those five have been junior resident associated access issues. Um, and so since the, the last two of them, we've developed a protocol to where um, the, all, the attending always does the proglide at the, at the conclusion of the case. And if there's any, you know, unless it is a absolute chip shot access, the attending actually does the access, and then we let the residents help with, you know, we let them do the diagnostic angiogram, we let them get up and over, we let them cross lesions, but, but mm -hmm. attendings do the access and closure. Yeah. I mean, from an educational standpoint, the residents are seen more by 2 p.m. than they're seen on our VA rotation for the whole week. You're really able to be that efficient with the, with the cases, so they're seen a lot more. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. I Sorry, when I was in training, so I'm more recently out, but when I was in training, um, it was different than the OBL I had in practice, but we were, I was trained at LSU and they had three um, access centers. And so both general surgery residents and us integrated vascular surgery residents would rotate at those access centers. And because it was dialysis patients and, and primarily dialysis cases, we were still able to do all the access in pretty much the entire case. Um, so I think that's one way to still allow, you know, residents to, to perform you know, important tasks at, 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 at the OBLs is, is dialysis access in particular. No, I was just gonna add, I, I, I'm very particular about my access as well. That's the most important part of the case in, in an office. Yeah, uh, let's move it on here, only a few more minutes, and I know everyone wants to get skiing, and again, I, I'm happy to chat about this on the lift or on the gondola as well. I'm really passionate about the OBL and excited to talk to any of you guys, even if you wanna reach out after the meeting, happy to chat. OBL patterns change practice. Um, you know, I mentioned EVARs. I mean, uh, there's going to be a time in the next probably five years where there will be a code for EVARs and carotids to be done in an ASC or OBL setting. Um, and so these things will be happening. I think it's important to embrace this change. I guess the question is, has your, has there any procedures that you guys are now doing that you weren't doing because you have an OBL? And I start by saying geniculate artery embolization. So. This is a procedure that we um, are toying with. Um, it's, you know, recently FDA approved. Um, embolization is a very lucrative code in the OBL setting. If you could put a coil in something or put spheres uh, into a vessel to occlude it, that reimburses very well. Um, and these um, patients with arthritis, with knee pain, um, could have the genicular arteries um, embolized. Sounds crazy as a vascular surgeon to embolize perfectly good arteries. It's it goes against everything we believe in, uh, but there's some data to suggest this and some people are doing it. And technically everyone in here likely has the skill set to do this. I have not done one yet, but these are things that I think are kind of push what you can do in an OBL. You start to think, hey, I can, I've got those devices on the shelf. I've got that, the skill set to do that. Should we be doing this if it works? Again, you know, the data suggests that it may work, but others may disagree with me. Uh, we're still trying to sort that out. Any thoughts? I practice the exact same in, in the procedure centers I do in the hospital. And, and I can, you know, we're, we're getting ready to put our data together with that um, and send it out. And, and part of that's because how I'm reimbursed, it's the same. It doesn't matter. The only difference is that $19 for sedation. <laughs> So are you doing geniculate artery embolization? Oh, no, no, I'm, oh, we, we don't do any general. genicular, oh, but yeah. it doesn't change my practice. Got being it. An OBL. Sure. Yeah, much like Matt, I practice the same way in yeah. hospitals yeah. I do in the yeah. OBL. The only difference is we've more recently started doing more toe amputations just for convenience. Um, we ran into that with, with, with COVID that we weren't able to get cases on or had trouble with get cases at hospitals. So we started doing them in the office setting. And we have found actually just from a convenience standpoint, it makes my life a lot easier to be able to see a guy on Wednesday with a bad toe take it off from the OBL the next day and not have to schedule them in the operating room and, and deal with the OR schedule and go at four o'clock on a Friday to do a toe amp. Yep, it's a great point. If a toe fell off in my clinic, does that count as an OBL? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'll bill for it though. <laughs> I'm just asking. 
We talked about sedation. We talked about procedure cost versus reimbursement versus convenience. Because our rent is so high and we pay so much, we find that access is really just a convenience for patients. Probably only 5 to 10 percent of the procedures I'm doing in the OBL are dialysis access. Um, because of our costs, we actually lose a couple hundred dollars on each patient, but it's so much more convenient for them to have it done there than go to the hospital with all the clearance and the MPO issues. It's just so much easier. We just take the hit financially on that uh, for the ease of the patient. Um, I'm sure if you guys are operating more lean in a lower cost environment, you're probably able to do these actually at a profit. We're, we're taking it a loss, but doing it for the convenience. Yeah, it, it's uh, the uh, dialysis access is one of the best procedures to do in an OBL, and it's one of the worst reimbursing for some reason. Uh, it, it almost loses money in every case, but it is it's so much less painful than doing trying to do it in the hospital system in a cath lab. Cases get canceled at least 50% of the time for every dialysis access case. We touched on this. I don't want to keep everybody. Um, Liz, we'll wrap up unless there's any other questions here. Really thank everybody for their attention. It's kind of the first time we've done a session like this, and we'd like to kind of do this more in the future because we do feel that OBLs, at least the leadership at, at best, feels that OBLs are going to be the future of our specialty. And if we don't embrace this and at least have some uh, input into their regulation and oversight, there is obviously potential for abuse. Um, but there's also potential for huge reward for, for the patients and, and for ourselves and our practices. All right, thank, thanks to the panel. Thank you, guys.